All right. Well, it is so different worshiping outside, isn't it? Um, there are some aspects of it that it's great to be outside, and there are some aspects that our singing does not project uh, as it normally does. So I want to encourage you in the future when we do that, let's turn to each other and let's sing and let's, uh, and let's encourage each other. Of course, it's that challenging when you've got your face mask on because usually when you turn to someone, you're smiling, you're encouraging them. It's that much more difficult when you're doing this. But I want to say this. I really appreciate uh, us saying, hey, listen, I want to come and be with the body of Christ. Now, I think it's important for me to say this every time we have an outdoor service that uh, we really understand if you have, uh, uh, you're concerned about your health and you wanted obviously to worship with us uh, online virtually today, that is absolutely fantastic. That's great. And we trust that you're going to be encouraged and inspired. Uh, but it's also great to be together in person and see each other's faces as, uh, as we worship our Lord together. So let's, before we go any further, let's go to our Father in prayer. Let's pray. Our God in heaven, we're just so grateful that we live in an incredible place like Ottawa and that we can come to a beautiful place, worship in freedom. And we know that there are many places in the world even now as our brothers and sisters have worshiped, will worship, or are worshiping right now, and they have some challenges. Some have to do it in secret. I pray, Father, that we never take for granted and that it uh, inspires us even more to share about what we have in your Son. Father, it is my deepest prayer this morning as I come before you and I present a topic that is, quite frankly, incredible that you will empower me with wisdom and insight so that the disciples who are gathered here today and those who are listening could be inspired challenged and encouraged to be drawn closer to your son thank you for his death because it meant le a life for us i thank you so much for the people who are putting themselves on the front line so that we can even be healthy and worship this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, there is nothing like being together and worshiping. And there is, it's an irreplaceable thing. And it's why the Bible talks about the fact that we should not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. And, and the value of being together and seeing each other's faces, limited as it is, is better than not being here. I mean, when I see you guys, the temptation is to run up and hug you. But I got to do the silly elbow thing, right? And, and even when we're worshiping together, we, uh, we, we got the masks on our face. We can't see the, 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 the face. We can't see the smiles or sometimes the challenge that is received. But that's okay. It's still okay being together. And so I just wanted to say before I talk about this topic this morning. I got to tell you, this topic... And the passage that I'm going to be using this morning, I feel honestly challenged. I feel a little bit overwhelmed. And so let's examine this scripture this morning. In Philippians chapter 2, of course, we're talking about the humility of Christ. I'm not. If you've been a follower of Christ for any period of time or you're thinking about following Christ, for sure you have heard this topic before. But I want to talk about something and I want to put some thoughts into your mind because I can tell you this. I, in my words, 
cannot do justice to this topic. The Holy Spirit is going to be needed to effectively communicate what this is indeed all about. So, in Philippians chapter 2, in verses 1 to 11, this is our text this morning. And this morning I'm going to read, be reading from the English Standard Version. And, uh, but obviously you can follow in whatever version you'd like. It says this. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from His love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ, who, th who though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This topic of humility of Christ, and not just the topic of humility, but the topic of humility through Christ, uh, of Christ rather, is a challenging one. And you'll see as I talk about this a little later. But I want to put before you this thought, this hypothesis, if you would, before I continue. If I were to come up here and I were to bring a noose up here, that's a rather repulsive thought, isn't it? It will bring emotions in us that is not very good. If we were to bring an electric chair up here, no one has a model of an electric chair in their home. The only reason they may have one is for antiquity sakes and it's for them to earn money. But the idea of having it as a model is not what someone does. And you can go on, there's so many symbols that bring about feelings and connotations that evokes some reaction. Think about this. Jesus, because of his humility, turned a death that was emblematic of being cursed and being a refuse of society as a mark of degradation to the point where that symbol today is anything but. Is anything but. Because of the humility of Jesus Christ. Think about that as we're going to be talking and you'll see why I feel a little bit overwhelmed as we talk about this topic. You know, it is, it is important for us to understand that you, to grasp this idea, should spend time on your own ruminating, praying, reading. Today, I literally want to be a signpost in regard to this topic. 
In other words, I am pointing you in the direction more than I'm asking you to really think about what I'm talking about. Because this topic is simply so overwhelming. It talks about the idea that the Son of God descended or condescended here on earth and it's important for us to understand what that means. When Paul writes this poem attributed, they said it was perhaps a poem or a song in the first century church, while it's theological, his purpose was not for it to be theological. It talks about theology, the idea that where you talk about the nature of God, that's what theology is, right? Why it talks about salvation, that's not the reason why he wrote this passage. To tell us about the salvic nature of who our God is. Instead, he uses it as an example. It is an exemplary poem and how we ought to, to imitate Christ. Now, before I go even any further, let me make it abundantly clear. There is no way that we can imitate Christ like this. I'll tell you why. None of us ever reached the height that Christ ever elevated to, that is, equal with God. And none of us will go to the depths that he did when he went to the prison and when he became obedient to a death, a death as horrific and a death as ugly as the cross. And so the delta between the height and the depth is so grand that we will never be able to fully grasp it, ever. However, he says, there is an attitude of humility. There is a mindset in regard to being unified in Philippians chapter 2. And he says, this is about selfless humility. Giving away of yourself. Now, you think about us. This morning, I thought about what clothes am I going to wear. And I did not think that I'm going to wear something that is going to make me look repulsive, even though I may look repulsive. But certainly that was not the reason that I chose the clothes that I do. Or the car that I drive or the way that I project myself is actually almost always I want to project myself in a good manner. And overall, that is obviously a good thing. And so the point that I'm trying to make there is that the tendency of humanity is actually always to project ourselves, not in a condescending, not in a way that shows humility, but au contraire, mon frere. Rather, you look at people who write music and sing music, they talk about all the money they have and all the girls that they can get and all the houses they can buy so that they're trying to tell you how great they are. As a matter of fact, a big marketing ploy that people do, they go and, write, they go and rent exotic cars, drive around on Facebook, and they try to project an image, look how successful I am, allowing people to think how successful I am. Therefore, I want you to buy my, my product. I want you to buy my program. Because you see, I'm successful. I'm going to make other people successful. And that's the idea. That's human nature. And a lot of people are very successful at that. Even just having a, having a projection. Christ, who had it within his grasp, chose not to exercise it. Chose not to exercise it. 
He says, you should have the same um, humility of Christ. That self-giving humility. The emptying of oneself. The power that God, Jesus had, and the fact that he was equal with God, was not something that he flaunted. As a matter of fact, read it in the scriptures, most of the time he tried to tell people, don't tell people the grand things that I did for you. Just the thought about that is a challenging thought. I must confess, even at times when I try to to give of myself, sometimes it's not always with the purest motives. And what I mean by that, it's sometimes cloaked in, I hope people really understand What a great ambassador of Christ I am. How great I am. But I will never say that. It is in our nature to be filled with pushing ourselves forward. The one who created this world and everything in it did not own a home. Most of the things that he had in his life, he borrowed. Even the tomb in which he was buried was borrowed. When he had to go and have the Last Supper, he had to go to somebody else's place. This humility of Christ is simply mind boggling. When my eldest son was getting married, I wanted to wear the right clothes, so I went and bought a new suit. And I said, I want to look good. Now, no one's misunderstanding. I'm just trying to tell you the nature of who we are. I'm not saying that that was necessarily bad. I'm saying the nature of who we are is self-aggrandizement. That's the nature. And the fact that Jesus did this is so amazing. And I'm telling you, we got to be careful in our culture of this idea of so taking care of myself, which I think there are some valid situations about that, that we actually neglect others. All under the auspices of taking care of myself. And only you know in your heart which one it is. And we should not be in judgment of others, but this is an idea of self-examination. The humility of Jesus Christ. He was the King of Kings. He was not born in a palace. As a matter of fact, He rode in on a donkey that was not even his. He had no place to lay his home. He lay his head. No place to call home. (laughs) The humility of Christ is simply unimaginable. The disciples... And the recording of what the acts of the disciples were is a quite telling nature of who we are. So many times, what? They argued who was the greatest. And so what did Christ do? He took off his clothes and he showed them what the greatest was like. In our culture today, we have a misunderstanding of what leadership is is like and Jesus says the greatest among you 
is actually those you serve. That your greatness as a leader is not how many people you lead, how many people you serve. Let that sink in for a moment. And it's so interesting when people talk and describe leaders in the world, oftentimes it talks about how many followers they have as opposed to how many people they serve. I think it's important for us as disciples to not get sucked in into this world. When Jesus demonstrated, the King of Kings demonstrated what he does, he washed the disciples' feet. He says, the greatest among you will be the one who serves the most. He says, I did not come to be served. In a lot of societies today, your success and your measurement of who you are is how many servants you have in your house. And how many people do things for you? And wash your laundry? And cook your food? And clean your house? And yet Jesus says, I will give my life as a ransom for many, for I did not come to be served. The idea here, is, I hope you're getting the drift of why I felt overwhelmed about talking about this, because the condescension from which Christ came, the height from which he came, was so high, we can't properly describe it. There's nothing to relate to in a manner of speaking. And in this culture, the depths to which he sunk, there's nothing for us to relate to. Our relation is I had to go into the regular line. I didn't get the priority access line at the airport. That the color of my card tells you how successful I am. The brand name that I wear tells you I'm doing all right. That's the way the world measures it. It's not the way Christ lived his life. Because we can never imitate his deity, of course, right? That, that, that is self-evident. We can never imitate his perfection or the redemptive power and work that he did. We can't even co completely copy his selfless humility because of what he had and what he gave up. I think it's really important that the Bible calls us and Paul writes, he says, each of you should not look only to your interest but also to the interest of others. And get this. I mean, I still wrestle with this one. Get this one here. Consider others better than yourself. I am so out of whack with that one that if I do that, it will be purely condescending and purely... Because there are a lot of times I don't believe that. And yet, the imitation of Christ and the humility that he existed purely demonstrated a life that he emptied himself completely. He started much higher than we did and went to much deeper depths than we did. Now, I think it's really important for us to understand this. 
the Bible talks about what we have in Christ, right? Um, and, and who we have become in Christ. It's, it's, it's important to understand there are some levels that we have attained to for sure when we are in Christ. The Bible says that we are a kingdom of priests. We're sons of God. And while we have, and, and we can go on to talk about the fact that we're co-heirs with Christ, that we are brother and with Christ, and there's so many other things. In this context, this is what the Bible says. Even though we have attained that, we still ought to be like Christ. That is not something to be grasped. And I'm telling you, one of the things that I'm concerned about, and like I said, we have to pray about the wisdom for this. But sometimes I think this mentality that has crept into the church is that I am the most important person, meaning me, and how I feel, and how my, where I'm at emotionally, spiritually, financially, physically, that's the most important thing, how I am doing. And I feel for the purposes of where we're at, I need to clarify and say, uh, there's no doubt about it. There's a value to that. But make sure that we don't buy into this mentality that I am the most important person in the world. It is the antithesis of Christianity. It is the exact opposite of who Christ is. He took up the fact that he became a slave, a servant of all. He gave up his heavenly principles and his heavenly possessions. He gave up his heavenly honor. He gave up his rights. He didn't fight back. He didn't argue. He didn't debate. He didn't demand. No, instead he went very low. My temptation in life is to be a fighter. I want to fight for me. This morning it's not about who you are. Remember we're talking about Christ's humility. We're talking about who this one is. Jesus says, or the scripture says, greater love has no one than, greater, uh, no one than this, that a man lays down his life for others. Not just laying down his life, but the kind of death that he died. You know, I remember as a young Christian, and I still hold to this, this phrase, so to speak, this motto. A lot of us would, would raise our fist in the air and say, yes, I will. I love Jesus so much. I am going, I would die for him. And I remember the preacher saying, there's no way you're going to die for Christ unless you live for him. No way. No way can we say we love God and not love our brothers and sisters. No way. Not possible. And yet there are many churches in Christianity today where the biggest factions and problems in a community is found within the halls of a church building. And we were not immune from that. Where humility did not reign, pride and selfishness reigned. And no one said, I'm going to empty myself. And it's what plagues Christianity today. A lot of cultures look and say, that's, if that's what Christianity is, I want no 
part of it. My goodness, you get on Facebook and you look at Christians screaming and yelling at each other. It is unbelievable. All under this ridiculous note of, I just have convictions. Where does it say in the scriptures that Jesus had so much convictions that he just absolutely hated on people and said vile words? We've got to learn to lead with love even with people that we disagree with. And how do we do that? Through humility. Oh, how unsearchable, unthinkable, unparalleled our Christ is. No one imagined that God would do this. No one would imagine this profound Christ would incarnate him, himself in such a way that to bring about salvation by his death and the way that he did. But the point of that passage is not about that. It's about the example of Christ. And the way that we live. Like I've said, yes, we have special standing in Christ. We are joint heirs with Christ. We're his friends. We're the living temples of God. The, the Holy Spirit comes and resides in us. We're ambassadors of Christ. We have every spiritual blessing. We're, we are chosen. We're adopted. We're called for His eternal purpose and glory. We're all of that. But we understand inherently that is not because something we've earned. So who am I and who are you to assert those rights? Those are the rights that Christ had and even more and He did not assert them. Wow! The humility of Christ is absolutely, incredibly profound. You know, the Bible says that God hates pride. There are a few things that the scripture says that God hates. But at the top of that list is pride. In your spousal relationships, how is your pride? In your children relationships, how is your pride? In your brotherly and sisterly relationships, how is your pride? In your relationship with your parents, how is your pride? You know, relatively recently I had a, we had a, Melanie and I had a counseling appointment with the family. I was stunned. And I don't get, I've seen a lot. I don't get stunned quite easily. I was stunned at this person who called themselves a Christian and the way they talked to their parent. I said, I'm 53 years old. I will never talk to my parents like that, ever. At the workplace, how is our pride? Sometimes we think this pride thing only applies, or, or this humility only applies at church and so on. That's not, that's not what it says. And so, I hope you grasped a little bit why I felt overwhelmed about this topic. I can't do justice to what that scripture talks about there. And so I ask you to go ahead and reflect and think about that. In humility, Christ did not consider equality with his Father something to be grasped. And I remember this phrase used in another context, but it applies in Christianity. Not because you can, done, can do something, doesn't mean you should. 
Not because you can do something, it doesn't mean that you should. Let me, let me paint some context for this. Especially when my kids were younger. I was bigger than they are, stronger than they are, had more money than they did, know the Bible better than they did, lived under my roof, could project a salient argument much more than they could. But not because I can. It doesn't mean I should. And oftentimes I find, sometimes I ask myself, is this allowed in Christianity? It's the, I think sometimes it's the wrong question. Oh, well, that's allowed. I can't imagine being married to my wife and I'm asking the question, honey, is this, uh, is this allowed in my relationship? Is this relationship with the opposite sex allowed? It's the wrong question. It's ridiculous. Not because we can. It doesn't mean that we should. That's what Philippians 2, bring, one of the things that it brings out. And like I said, that passage is not about soteriology, salvation, not about theology, the divine nature of God, even though it has all of that. It's about modeling and exemplifying self-emptying humility. That's what that passage is all about. And that is Christ. How this applies to you, you've got to figure it out. You've got to pray about it. But I do know this. When the Christ died on the cross for your sins and my sins, what an unbelievable example of humility and so I know for a lot of us who are online and watching this virtually we're about to take our communion we'll have a song in a moment that prepares our heart for the communion hopefully you've brought some communion stuff if you haven't uh, we have some extras raise your hand while the song has been sung we'll bring you a communion uh, stuff all right uh, but let us really reflect that hideous cross is now an emblem of love and absolutely adored form of punishment simply because of the humility of Christ. Think about that. Let's sing.